going down. Woo! All right. Are you ready this evening? Yes. Is anybody else ready this evening? Yes. All right. As I tell you often, uh, it's, it's not my intention to teach you something that you don't know. That doesn't mean you won't hear something that you don't know. But I'm not creating something new to bring to you today. Listen, there have been people preaching out of this book for thousands of years. And if the Lord tarry, we will still be preaching out of this book for thousands of years. It's inexhaustible. Okay, so, so there is always something old to be learned as new. Think about that. There is always something old to be learned as new. Just because it's been around doesn't mean it, it can't be fresh. And so that's why it's important. I, I remind you of this often. That's why it's important that, that we have uh, a, an, an open spirit. We've come to receive of the spirit of God today. Uh, you didn't come just to, to learn in your mind. We are not focusing on head knowledge, but rather revelation knowledge. And uh, we'll talk about that some. I don't want to get over there now, but it's coming. All right. Um, we'll give a little bit of review, and then, and then we'll go on here. So, um, for the last two weeks... We've been talking, we really, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit, but we're talking about praying in tongues, and, and I understand that I'm, I'm not driving at this from the, the, the seat of praying in tongues. There's a reason for that, and I probably shouldn't tell you my reason, it might negate the effectiveness, but sometimes if we hear the same thing the same way, we say, I've heard that, and, uh, because again, we end up looking for something new. But if I'll tell you the same thing a new way, you'll think it's new. Yeah, um, it's, it's like going a different way to work and you find out that, uh, oh, wow, I didn't know this was here. Well, it was there the whole time. You just never went that way. Therefore, you never saw it. Right. But it was there the whole time. It didn't get created because you chose to drive a different way that day. So I, I, I bring some things out oftentimes a little different than than what dad does or or um, what a lot of a lot of people that we may have heard around here do well, because I'm a different person. That's just how it is. You're all different people. We're all different. And we, we learn in, yeah, surprise, we learn in different ways. Sometimes we need to hear things um, a little differently. So anyway, but let's go on. Uh, so reviewing. So we've been talking about the Holy Spirit. Um, and and we're, we're, I slide this in uh, towards the end of these messages, but praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, coming up next week, I know I told you last week that it was possible I would get to it today and give you a hundred reasons why you should pray in the Holy Ghost. I'm not going to do it today. I have it with me in case we get that far, but I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm going to. Um, so it is my intention to give that to you next week. And it's actually 101, not 100. Uh, one, one more added. So 101 Dalmatians, 101 reasons to pray in the Holy Ghost. So we'll get there, but I'm kind of excited about that just because it's, it's just cool. You think there's that many reasons and there's probably more. That's just Anyway, um, but we're talking about the Holy Ghost and, and uh, speaking in tongues. We've started out focusing on, on two things. First, that the Holy Spirit is a spirit of knowledge, right? You remember that? The Holy Spirit is a spirit of knowledge. Uh, and we can really use this, this verse for, for connecting uh, the, the both of them. But Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18, let's look at it and Amplified real quick. It's a real quick review. I have a lot to give you tonight and... Um, and Hopefully we get it all in. And I pray that the eyes of your heart, the very center and core of your being, be enlightened, flooded with light by the Holy Spirit, so that you will know and cherish the hope, the divine guarantee, the confident expectation to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. The Holy Ghost knows stuff. Yes. He knows stuff. He was with God from the beginning. You say, well, I thought that was Jesus. Yes, it's all the same. It's all the same. They were all with each other. The Holy Spirit brooded over the faces of the water before God ever said, let there be. The Holy Spirit was there in the beginning. The Son was there in the beginning. The Father was there in the beginning. The Holy Ghost knows stuff. And He wants you and I to know stuff. So he doesn't want to hang on to the knowledge himself. He wants to reveal it to us. We also began last week and we talked about the Holy Ghost being a spirit of. Say it with confidence. Say it with power. power. The Holy Ghost is a spirit of. Power. power. He is not a weak, mealy mouse Holy Ghost. 
Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, and you shall receive power. Say it like you mean it. And you shall receive power. power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now, I understand that not all the time does the Holy, Holy Ghost speak with wind, fire, thunder, lightning. You know, I understand that it's not always like that. But you got to always understand it is always powerful. It may not always be loud, but it is always powerful. It may not always be boisterous, but it is always powerful. I'm talking about the power of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost may not always be demonstrative, but he's always powerful. Right? So even the still small voice is powerful. Even the whispers of the Holy Ghost to you are powerful. I don't want to get, get off in it, but Brother Hagin talks about the louder God has to speak to you, in one sense, the more trouble you're about to face. Because he, he had to, you know, shout it, so to speak. Now, he didn't say all this. I'm adding to it. I think that one of the reasons why the more trouble that you would be about to face is for... for uh, if, if the Holy Ghost had to speak to you potentially in an audible voice or so loudly, one of the reasons why you may, might, might be facing deep trouble is because apparently you weren't attentive to the first still small voice. Not necessarily because of the, calam- the uh, impending calamity. That could be it. So that might be a second. The trouble is, is big on the outside, but it could have been trouble on the inside, which makes the trouble on the outside big. In other words, you couldn't hear him when he whispered. You couldn't hear him when he brought you to that scripture. You couldn't hear him when your friend talked to you or when your pastor talked to you. And so eventually he has to come and bust through the window in a bright shining light and say, I am the Lord thy God. You know, whatever. You get my point. So I want to be one that is constantly aware of the presence of the Holy Ghost. How about you? Okay, we used to play this little game around here. Uh, I learned it from my wife in her kindergarten class called That's Me. So you can say amen or that's me. If something pertains to you and you say that's who I want to be or that's who I am, you can make the phrase, very good, that's me. I, for one, want to be one who's always attentive to the presence of the Holy Ghost. I want to always know that he's speaking. I want to always know that he's guiding. I want to always know that he's leading. I want to always know that he's helping. I want to always recognize and realize that he is powerful. Yeah. So uh, Kelly sang the song for us. 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I rephrased it this way. It says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but he has given us a spirit. In that song, that's how, the, how we sing it. God has not given us a spirit of fear, da, 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 da. but he has given unto us a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and a spirit of a sound mind. So that's the kind of power that we received. And we talked about the disciples going up into the upper room. And in the, the book of Luke, Jesus tells them to tarry in, in Jerusalem. Uh, that's Luke 24, 49. I didn't give you the reference last week, but Luke 24, 49. He says, I will send the promise of my Father upon you. Oh, I'm going to pull a Pastor Wayne. I don't have time for this, but I would like to take you, and then he takes us anyway. Galatians 3, 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us, for it is written, curse is everyone that hangs on a tree, verse 14. That. The blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. What is that blessing? That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So look back again at Luke 24. And he says, the promise of my father. So if you will wait in Jerusalem, I will send the promise of my father. So he spoke about it way back then. And now it's coming in into being. So in Acts 2, he tells us, uh, well, they're they're in the upper room, they're they're waiting, and the Holy Ghost comes in that upper room. They were not waiting for the day of Pentecost. They were waiting for the promise of the Father, which they understood at that point to be the Holy Ghost. Jesus explained that to them in John 14, 15, 16. He explained that to them. It's the Holy Ghost that I will send unto you. So they knew that. But just like you can read in, in Acts, and maybe we'll get there at some, some future point when we talk about the spirit of joy, we'll, we'll talk about this city. But they did not even know there'd be such a Holy Ghost. And so we'll get that later. Um, 
But so uh, at, at the time, they were cognizant of the anointing. They recognized the, they recognized the power of God. They recognized the anointing. We'll talk about this in a little bit, uh, um, some, some more. Uh, but they didn't know the person of the Holy Ghost. Because at that point, the person of the Holy Ghost or even the anointing didn't dwell on everybody. It wasn't in everybody. It was only on a few. So at that point in time, it was, uh, and you can make an argument that it was in John the Baptist and it was in Jesus because, you know, the, the Holy Spirit came in G- and John the Baptist leaped in the mother's womb. Okay, but even still being, it was only on or in a few, not widespread or not even possible for everyone. You say, well, God is no respecter of persons. What he'll do for one, he'll do for another. No, that's not true. God is no respecter of persons, but we add that phrase, what he'll do to one, he'll do for another, by the way. That's a man-made, added-on phrase. God has done lots of things for one that he didn't do for another. God has done, I'll say it again, God has done lots of things for, for one person that he didn't do for another. He's done a lot of things for a lot of people that he didn't do for other groups of people. So God is no respecter of persons, but he will do things for some people that he won't do for others. As a matter of fact, what is it, Matthew 5... Uh, six, they that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Well, you take the converse of that. If you don't hunger and thirst, you won't be filled. Well, whose fault is that? Is that God's? No. He made a deal. If you want it, you can have it. But those that don't want it, I'm not giving it to you. Why? Because he's unwilling to cast his pearls before swine. And the most precious thing that he could do was give us the Holy Ghost. The most precious thing is to give us the Holy Ghost. All right. So when they were filled with the Holy Ghost, they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So we understand that the utterance comes by the Spirit. But the promise was that they would receive the Spirit and that they would receive power. And so we talked about tongues and recognizing that when you receive the Holy Ghost, how many of you received the Holy Ghost in the room? That's me. When you received the Holy Ghost, you did not receive a prayer language. You received the Holy Ghost. You received power. You received knowledge. You received a bunch of other stuff, and some of them we'll talk about later on. But they began to speak with other tongues. They were not waiting in Jerusalem for a prayer language. Sometimes as Pentecostal, we magnify the prayer language above the Holy Ghost. And that should not be done. That should not be done. The prayer language is a one tool that the Holy Ghost uses to bring things from there to here through you. I don't have too much time to preach a message on confession, but you can take it from the very beginning, God said. So in order for something to come into existence, a God has to say. And we are made like as unto God. If we speak the word of God, we have the creative power just like God. And so God speaks through us by the Holy Spirit when we are speaking in tongues. And we talked about that a little bit in the, in the, uh, in the spirit of knowledge. And we'll get to it even some more when we talk about tongues and interpretation of tongues if we get there tonight. So, then we, we, so we talked about the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of power. Is everybody back up the speed? Good. All right. So let's let's move on. Now, praying in the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. I know I just said that, but it's more than a language, right? Yes. Amen. Yes. It is knowledge and power coming together. Yes. Praying in the Holy Ghost is knowledge and power coming together. When we are unknowledgeable or ignorant about something about a matter we are powerless to do anything about it Mm -hmm. i'll say that again when we are unknowledgeable or ignorant that's what that means unknowledgeable ignorant when we're unknowledgeable or ignorant about a matter we are powerless to do anything about it about the matter you've likely heard the phrase knowledge is power have you ever heard that 
Well, some guy coined the phrase in 1549. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Um, but the, the phrase has been used pretty much ever since then. But the principle goes way beyond the guy in 1549. Did I say 1949? If I said 1949, I meant 1549. I said 1540. Okay. So you've likely heard that phrase, knowledge is power. And in seemingly every way imaginable, the statement holds true. Let's think of some. If your car breaks down and you don't know how to fix it, you need an auto mechanic. Right? If your roof is leaking and you don't know how to fix it, you need a roofer. Simple questions. If you're lost somewhere on the road and you need directions, who do you get them from? From a GPS, from a map, from somebody who lives there, from somebody who knows the way to go, right? So the person without knowledge is at the mercy of a person with knowledge, okay? If you think they have knowledge and they say you go down here, you turn at the second light, turn to the left, and then you're going to go three blocks and turn to the right, and there it is, you say... Okay, and you trust their knowledge because you have less knowledge than they. You don't even know yet at that point if their knowledge is accurate. You are at their mercy. If you don't know how to deal with a difficult situation, you need counsel or advice, right? So who do you go to? Why do you go to a counselor? Because they're expected to have knowledge, right? So your car breaks down you, and you don't know how to fix it, you need a what? A mechanic. If your roof leaks and you don't know how to fix it, you need a, a roofer. If you're lost, you need somebody who knows the way. If you don't have wisdom or knowledge or if you, if you don't have understanding, you go to somebody who potentially does. The ignorant are dependent upon the knowledgeable. Therefore, a person with knowledge becomes the controller of the situation. Why? Because they are the key holder to the solution. The ignorant are dependent upon the knowledgeable. Therefore, a person with knowledge becomes the controller of a situation. Because they hold the key to the solution. I'll give you a a parallel. Similarly here in Proverbs chapter 22, 7. The Bible says, The rich rule over the poor... And the borrower is servant to the lender. Let's use these same examples that we used before. Your car is broke. You don't have knowledge to fix it. So you go to a a mechanic. You hire the mechanic. What do you have to do? You have to pay. Now the man with knowledge also has your money. Your roof leaks. You don't know how to fix it. So you go and hire a... And you have to, and you have to pay. Now the man with knowledge gets your money. money. The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. It works with finances. It works with knowledge. It works with experience. It works with equipment. I borrowed a pen a little. I was without a pen. I lacked something. Melissa had a pen. I was at her mercy because I did not have time to go looking elsewhere. She was gracious and merciful upon me, a wretched sinner without a pen. No, she was, she extended mercy because she was the one who had what I lacked, right? So out of her mercy, she gave to me what I needed. God, out of his mercy, gave to us what we needed, the Holy Ghost, That's the whole reason, I I, I know I could probably find some doctrinal argument here, but you know what, I don't want to go there, I don't know if it's worth it today. But the whole reason um, for for, for the crucifixion was so, you know what, I say this when I I taught on the, the tabernacle, Kelly, you have remembered this phrase forever. What was, what was the, okay, the concept. What was, what was the whole thrust of the teaching on the tabernacle of Moses? If you didn't get anything, I wanted you to come away with the understanding that God has an intense desire to dwell in the hearts of man. An intense desire to dwell in the hearts of man. From the beginning, he wouldn't have created you if he didn't want to be with you. He would have left it at the earth and the animals. 
Before that, he would have left it at the angels. He had an intense desire to have a love relationship. He had an intense desire to be one with somebody. And he could not be one with the angels because they didn't have the volition or the choice to worship them like you and I have the volition and the choice to do so. So there couldn't be that unity by will that you and I can have. And by the will of God, he extended his mercy upon us who lacked ability, who lacked power, who lacked knowledge, who lacked understanding, who lacked the ability to be holy. Out of his mercy, he gave what he had unto us, put it inside of us so that then we are no longer without power. His very being, his very spirit coming to dwell inside of us out of his mercy. Hallelujah. Whew. When we are unknowledgeable or ignorant about a matter, we're powerless to do anything about it. Um, when I was a kid growing up, I, I was sharing this briefly with the men yesterday at, at the men's meeting. Um, there was a cartoon called G.I. Joe. Now, there's some more recent movies and stuff that are out now that have, that have come out. G.I. Joe, right? Anybody seen any G.I. Joe stuff? A bunch of liars. How many have seen G.I. Joe stuff? You're nodding your head, but unwilling to raise hands. I see what it is. It's, it's shame and guilt. You don't, you don't want to be known. That, okay. Um, so G.I. Joe was an action figure, and they came out with a series of cartoons, 95 episodes to be exact. They came out with a series of cartoons that supported the action figure, right? And at the end of the cartoons, there was a little 30-second, they call them PSAs, um, Public service announcements. There was a little 30-second PSA at the end of every G.I. Joe episode. And it went along the lines of something to the effect of a kid or a few kids about to get in trouble, about to cause some kind of problem, about to hurt themselves or hurt somebody else or break something or some situation that wasn't desirable, right? And the G.I. Joe character steps in and he stops it and he saves the day and then he gives a little teaching and instruction to the kid or a, seri- or, or, or a few kids or whatever. And he tells them, now this is da 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 you know. Don't, give your, don't ever tell somebody that you're not, not home. That's unsafe. And don't give people your address and whatever. Okay. All right? And the kid responds with something like, well, now I know. And G.I. Joe character responds with, and knowing is half the battle. G.I. <laughs> Joe. Right? You didn't know all that. Well, it's the truth. Um, Knowing may or may not always be half the battle, because I can refute the statement with a lot of examples, but my point is knowledge, so we're going to stay there for a moment. Knowing may or may not always be half the battle, but it is always a key component. It is always a key component. Another key component is power. And when I say power, I specifically am referring to will and ability. Will and ability. The want to and the ability to do so. How many of you want to be able to create a million dollars in front of you? I have a lot of good I can do with it. You better believe I'd, I'd love, to, love to create it. But we understand it. Whatever. Okay. Come up with another analogy that works better for you because a lot of you didn't raise your hands and I don't understand why. Uh, Because uh, you need a bigger vision because if the Lord unleashed that kind of funds, there'd be a lot of ministry supplied. There'd be a lot of things. I didn't want to go to jail. Oh, you didn't want to go to jail. Okay. You are so overthinking. Anyway, um, I would love the ability to fly. It'd be awesome. All right. I, so I, as much will as I have, I have no physical ability to do so. God didn't make me that way. It was not his will that I fly. If he, if he wanted me to fly, he'd have made me a pilot. Anyway, that was good. Some of y'all are thinking. Three of you laughed. That was good. All right. So, there are, so, so you might have knowledge. Okay, let's take these examples. You might have knowledge on how to fix your car. But if you lack the willpower and or the ability to do so... You need a a mechanic, a roofer. 
That was funny. You might have the knowledge on how to fix your roof, but if you lack the willpower or the physical ability to fix your roof, you need a a roofer. You need a roofer, right? So we understand that. So it takes knowledge, will, and ability. So knowledge and power. So there are two key components. There are other components, but there are two key components to getting any job done. Knowledge and power. Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. James 1, says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You cannot do if you don't have the ability to do. So just because you have knowledge does not mean you have the ability. Those are two necessary components in order to get any job done. Jesus said, Matthew 7, verse 24, he said, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, he's like a wise man that builds his house upon a rock. So if you hear his sayings, that means you have just gained knowledge. If you do his sayings, Jesus is saying, if you hear and do, you'll be, you, you are considered wise. I preached a while back pretty, pretty clear and repetitively on that. You go in that same chapter down to verses 28 and 29, and it says, and it came to pass... So remember, that's Jesus. He talks about the man who built his house upon the rock, the man who built his house upon the sand, right? Verse 28 and 29 says, And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these things, when he finished the story of the man who built the house on the rock and the house, the man that built the house on the sand, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority. Some translations say, not many, by the way, say power. No, I don't want you to say power. You can say power. Say power. Power. Some translations, not many, but a couple say say power there. The the implication is well understood. Authority. that That Jesus spoke as one having authority or that Jesus spoke as one having power, not as the scribes. See, the scribes had knowledge. They knew the word better than anybody. They sat and argued all day long, the scribes and the Pharisees. They were Jews, by the way. They just sat there and argued the scriptures, argued the scriptures, argued the scriptures, argued the scriptures. You can't argue something, at least effectively, if you don't have knowledge. There is no question that they had knowledge, but it is apparent that they had no power. Knowledge does not produce power. So there's something critical in our thinking about knowledge. The people were astonished at Jesus' doctrine, not because he had natural knowledge, but because he spoke with authority. He spoke from a position of spiritual knowledge and of truth. Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, Peter and John, they're going into the temple, they see a lame man, right? Uh, Verse 6, then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And they took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaped up and stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. I thought that was interesting that they didn't see him leaping. It just didn't say that. If you were paying good attention, you caught that too. Uh, And so they go on to preach Jesus Christ, him crucified and him risen. If you read that out in Acts chapter 3, that's what you find. So we're going to jump to Acts chapter 4, verses 1. And as they spoke unto the people, as they preached, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They laid their hands on them, which means they grabbed them. They put them, they took them under arrest, and they held them till the next day because it was evening. Jump to verse 7, please. When they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power... By what power and by what name have you done this? Then Peter, with the, full of the Holy Ghost, say that with me, filled with the Holy Ghost. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Peter was full of the Holy Ghost. He was full. Yeah, that's me. See, Peter and John did the miracle because of the power of the Holy Ghost. Everybody that saw it, especially those with knowledge, recognized that something was done, and I, I, this is just my own opinion, I just think it flat made him jealous. And I'll get to show you why I think it just flat made him jealous. So jump all the way down to verse 13. So they're, 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 they're going to do bad stuff to them. 
And they said, oh, you know what? We better not do that for fear of the people. So just, just hold on. We'll, we'll, we'll reprimand them. We won't beat them. We won't kill them, whatever. Verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant, unlearned and ignorant, they marveled and they took knowledge. They just learned something. The most knowledgeable people of the day just learned something from the unknowledgeable people of the day. The most knowledgeable just learned something from ignorant, unknowledgeable Peter and John. What did they learn? They learned that they had been with Jesus. Peter and John had a power that did not come by head knowledge. They had a power that came by a knowledge that was in their spirit. They had a power that came by a spiritual knowledge. You could call that experience if you want, but it was beyond natural experience. It was a spiritual experience. Spiritual knowledge comes by spiritual experience. You say, well, doesn't spiritual knowledge come by the word? Yes, it does. And unless you experience the life of the word, it is not spiritual knowledge to you. You can read it all day long and it's simply head knowledge. But if it comes alive, it becomes spiritual knowledge in addition to head knowledge. Don't confuse yourself into thinking that because you know something in your head that you know something in your spirit. Keith Moore says don't make the lethal mistake of thinking that just because you know something that you're doing it. But rather what we understand by that is that we do according to knowledge. We act and we live according to knowledge. We act according to our spiritual knowledge, according to what we believe. So it's not natural knowledge that we need, but rather spiritual knowledge. It's not natural knowledge. It is spiritual knowledge. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. And I was going to take you all the way through 31, which is the last verse of, of, of chapter 1, and then we were going to go into chapter 2, but I'm not going to have time to do that, so we'll hit the key, the key parts here. So, but if you wanted the whole thing in context, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17, all the way to the end of the chapter, verse 31, so we'll start out. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Jump down, please, to verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world, by wisdom, knew not God. Let's look at that in the NIV, please. For since in the wisdom of God, the world, through its wisdom, did not know Him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. What is He saying here? I didn't read the whole thing in the King James. We read the whole thing in the NIV. God is saying... So God is saying that you can have knowledge, you can have knowledge of the scripture. You can have intense knowledge of the scripture and still not know him. And I mentioned to you about the apostle Paul, how he was the most elect in knowledge concerning the the, the scriptures. History teaches us that he was about to be the high priest and yet he did not know Jesus He didn't see all of that that he knew. He didn't realize that it all spoke of one man, Jesus. He was still on the search for who the scriptures spoke about until he met him on a road to Damascus. Jump to verse 24. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Remember I told you that knowledge and power are come together in the person of the Holy Ghost. Knowledge and power have come together in the person of the Holy Ghost. That's our point today. That's our title. Well, not exactly that. I don't know exactly how I read it earlier, but that's, that's, the, that's the essence. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And he goes on through the rest of these verses, and it's just incredibly powerful, but for lack of time, we'll jump to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and, uh, and, and in 1 through 16, which we read already, but let's emphasize verse 4. My speech, this is Paul saying, he says, My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit 
and of power, that your faith would not be in knowledge, that your faith would not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. In the power of God. Verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of our glory. And then uh, we also emphasize in previous, uh, our, our first week in verse 10. But God has revealed them to us by his spirit. Natural knowledge is powerless in the realms of the spirit. Are you with me still? Natural knowledge is powerless, absolutely powerless in the realms of this, natural knowledge is good in the realms of the natural. But natural knowledge is powerless in the realms of the spirit. Now, on the flip side, not only is spiritual knowledge powerful in the realms of the spirit, but spiritual knowledge is powerful in the realms of the natural. Spiritual knowledge is powerful in the realms of the natural. Natural knowledge is powerless in the realms of the spirit. But you have been given both the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of power. Look to your neighbor and say, I have the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of power. Look to your other neighbor and say, it was given to me by Jesus when he gave me the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, we read it a moment ago, moment ago, and I want to add in a definition of the word Christ here. So the end of that verse says, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So Christ, the anointed one and his anointing is the power of God and the wisdom of God. We read these verses before, we'll do them again though. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, also verse 27, but ye have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. Verse 27, but the anointing, that's the same word. It's the same Greek word used in both verses. In verse 20, it says unction. In verse 27, it says anointing. You have an anointing. It's related to the same as Jesus the Christ, the anointed one, and his anointing. Christ 1 Corinthians 1, 24, Christ, the anointed one and his anointing, is the power of God. You have that same power. You have that same power. It was Jesus who is the baptizer of the Holy Ghost and with fire. John the Baptist said he was. Jesus confirmed it. He confirmed it on several occasions, one being on the day of Pentecost, the other, the day I got filled with the Holy Ghost. Knowledge and power have come together to abide and work in you through the person of the Holy Spirit. Say that to your neighbor. Knowledge and power have come together to abide and work in me through the power of the Holy Ghost. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. In the Amplified, here we go. You ready to listen fast? This is Paul speaking. He says, I bow my knees in reverence before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family of heaven and earth derives its name, God, the first and ultimate Father. May he grant you out of the riches of his glory to be strengthened and spiritually energized with power through his spirit in your inner self or in your spirit, indwelling your innermost being and personality so that Christ, the anointing, the anointed one and his anointing, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. God had an intense desire to dwell in the hearts of man. That, this is what that is. This is the manifestation of that intense desire. It was a picture in the old, in the temple, and in the, and in the tabernacle. It's a, it's a realization in you. It's a realization in me. Verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and may you, having been deeply rooted and securely grounded in love, be fully capable of comprehending. That is ability, capable, capability. That you have the ability to know. That's power and knowledge coming together. That being fully capable of comprehending with all saints. By the way, it's God's desire that all saints be fully capable of comprehending. 
that all saints, God's people, that we comprehend the width and length and height and the depth of his love, fully experiencing, we talked about experiential knowledge, fully experiencing that amazing endless love, verse 19, and that you may come to know knowledge, not head knowledge, but knowledge in the heart and the inner man. Practically, through personal experience, the love of Christ, which far surpasses head knowledge, or even a knowledge without experience, that you may be filled throughout your entire being to all the fullness of God, the full indwelling of the Holy Ghost in you, so that you may have the richest experience of God's presence in your life, completely filled and flooded with God himself. Hallelujah. And then we go on to verse 20. Now to him who is able to carry out his purpose and to do super abundantly more than all we dare ask or think infinitely beyond our greatest prayers, hopes, or dreams according to his power that is at work within you. His power is at work within you. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. He is at work in you. He is at work in me. The Holy Ghost is at work in you. Look to your neighbor. Tell him, the Holy Ghost is at work in you. His power is doing something in you. His knowledge is coming alive to you. He's, well, you don't have to keep repeating. I'm just telling you. You can keep repeating it if you want to. He's revealing Jesus to you. Jesus said that the Holy Ghost would not speak of himself, but that he would speak of Jesus. Jesus didn't speak of himself. He spoke of the Father. The Holy Ghost is revealing Jesus to you. And as you are aware of the ever-infilling and ever-flowing presence, the ever-teaching, the ever-guiding, the ever-knowing, the ever-leading, the ever-comforting, the ever-powerful presence of the Holy Ghost, he is revealing Jesus unto you. And as Jesus is revealed more and more unto you, the things of the earth grow strangely dim. Well, I didn't quite finish, but that's okay. We're at a good stopping point. Father, we thank you for the Holy Ghost. We thank you that your power is at work in us. The power of the Holy Ghost is at work in me. Say that. The power of the Holy Ghost is at work in me. Thank you, God, for working in me, both to will and to do of your good pleasure. The Holy Ghost is revealing Jesus unto me. I'm never without knowledge. I am never without power because I'm never without the Holy Ghost because he will never leave me nor forsake me. I thank you, Father, for the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, I've got to close. You are free to go. You are free to stay. Either way, you are free. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Inside and out and everywhere you go and everything yet you do, freedom belongs to you by the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. Glory to God. Now we know. And knowing is half the battle. (laughs) Woo! Hallelujah. Kevin, if you would, play some music. And and if you want to just spend some time with the Holy Ghost, do so. If you've got something to go to, that's okay. Good, take care of it. Go take care of business. Take care of whatever kind of business you got, whether it's spiritual business or whether it's natural business. Doesn't matter at all. It's got to be taken care of. Go, go, go get her done. Thank you, Lord.